Welcome to the latest episode of Renovating Retirement with Charlie Jewett and Bobby Alford. This show confronts the retirement planning industry and reveals all of the tricks, lies, and scams the stockbrokers, insurance agents, and financial advisors use to steal money from consumers. In addition, Charlie and Bobby will teach you everything you need to know to make your own financial and retirement decisions and live the retirement of your dreams. Now here are your hosts, Charlie and Bobby. All right, everybody, welcome back to Renovating Retirement. My name is Bobby Alford. He's Charlie Jewett. We are coming to you live from two separate vacation locations. And uh, I'm Hawaii, and he's about to be 5-0. So we are Hawaii 5-0 today. It's the only place we could record, so we had to resort to this. Ha 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 He's so punny. He's so punny, ladies and gentlemen. Well, if you have missed our other two episodes, what we are covering here is the 10 reasons not to buy Indexed Universal Life or IUL. And we are going through a Todd Langford article that is almost 10 years old. This month, it is 10 years old. Uh, We are recording in uh, the middle of April 2022. And this article was written at the end of April 2012, which is crazy that we did did this by accident. (laughs) But uh, this is almost 10 years old exactly. And by the time you watch this video, Mr. Charlie Jewett will be a year older. And his 50th birthday is this coming week. Hey, happy birthday. Talk to me when I'm 50. I'll be so much wiser at that point. So much, so much wiser. So much All wiser. right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to hop over. And we're going to recap what we've covered so far. I'm going to show the article to those of you watching uh, on YouTube or wherever this is hosted. And um, you're going to be able to see the, the video is going to be us. But also I'm going to reference in the article the entire time and I'll read it to you listening at home on podcast. So let me flip over and share this article that we are going to be referencing. Perfect. So for those watching, this is the article, the top 10 reasons not to buy equity indexed universal life written April 27th, 2012, almost exactly 10 years ago. And just to recap, the topics we have covered on previous episodes are numbers 10 through 7. We're going to cover 6, 5, and 4 on this episode and finish it off with 3, 2, and 1 on the next episode. So here we go. Number 10, internal costs are not guaranteed. Number 9, mortality charges are not guaranteed. Number 8, market drops cause double, double pain. Number seven, late premiums kill any guarantees. Number six, dividends from index don't get credited, asterisk. Number five, participation ratios are often less than 100%, asterisk. Number four, returns are usually capped at various interest rates, asterisk. Number three, guarantees are not calculated annually, asterisk. Number two, all of the above can be changed by the company. And number one, the risk is shifted back to the insured. So today we are going to cover six, five, and four. And we're going to start with dividends from the index don't get credited. So let us go over here to this asterisk number six. And I will read to you word for word. Equity indexed universal life policies provide the policyholder no credit for any dividends from the stocks making up the index. The side fund of an EIUL isn't actually invested in the index. Instead, the index is used to determine the gross crediting rate for the side fund. If money were actually invested in the index, the investor would get both the change in net asset value, parentheses, whether up or down, and the dividend income. However, in the case of the EIUL, only the change in the value of the index is the determining factor, and the dividend is left out of the calculation entirely. What are we thinking about that, Charlie? 
It's just like, I have the same answer to every one of these points. It's like, okay, and? Like, so what are we using index universal life insurance to compare? What are we comparing it to? Well, you could compare it to whole life, or you can compare it to the stock market. Like when we're looking, you know, we're working with clients. And we say, here's how the stock market works. Here's how competing strategies work or the other options for where your dollars could be, right? So you could be in the market, all the ups and all the downs, including getting all the dividends, buying the, by the way, guess where the other place you don't get all the dividends are? It's when you're with a money manager who doesn't just put you in the S&P 500 and spreads your money around in mutual funds and things like that. You might not get all the dividends. Sometimes you don't. They put you in other things. But if you're in the index, like you know Warren Buffett says in his trust, his estate plan, you know, to his wife or whatever, if I die, just go into the index. If you're in the index, you get all the ups, all the downs, and you get all the dividends. Okay, does that make more than being in an indexed universal life insurance policy built the right way when you don't get the dividends? That's the question, not picking something mm-hmm. that doesn't exist. There isn't an indexed universal life insurance policy where you also get the index or the dividends than saying, hey, this is bad news that you don't get them. Why? I don't understand what that means. There's a way that the product is built. They buy options, basically, on the on the index. Mm-hmm. It goes up, you make money. It goes down, there's uh, there's no money to be made and you don't lose anything. The cost of options goes away. But I don't understand what the point is. It's not a reason not to buy equity index universal life insurance. And then wh- I know his company. He says, buy whole life insurance, okay? <clears throat> Where you give up diversification now, which is even more solid, <laughs> a solid fundamental of, of financial planning than, than getting dividends. You give up diversification. You're not making money on the 500 top most widely traded stocks. You're picking one single company, one single company in one industry saying, I'm going to put all of my eggs in one basket, just the dividends from you guys, this company, however you do for the rest of my life, I'm fine with that. Right. And I actually, I, I read this and I and I say, this this isn't actually a reason not to buy IUL. This is a reason to buy IUL. And here's why I say that. Because what you're what you're doing is you're giving up the dividend. He's right on that. You're not investing in the market, but you're also getting a floor of zero. If I can give up potential dividend income, which we are saying these companies give off dividends, but they can also adjust dividends. So I don't know what the specific rate ratio would be if you gave it up versus not. But now I'm saying if you give that up and you get credited based on the index performance, not the dividends and all the other stuff, but I have a floor of zero, that is a reason to buy IUL. You know, all you're doing is giving up a, di- a potential dividend, but now you don't have to have losses at all. And so then if it does go down, you have that zero, you get that reset, you get that amazing recovery when the index recovers. Holy crap, I would buy that every day if that's if I understood that's how it works. I mean, that's yeah, to so me, that's saying, a selling point. What do you think, Charlie? Exactly. You're <laughs> saying it's is an apples, he's trying to make it like an apples to apples argument. Anytime you say this is a reason not to buy, you say because mm-hmm. you don't get the dividends. That's an apples to apples argument. Getting the dividends would be good, not getting them is bad. That's apples to apples. Reality is, which he's, he's you know, it's not even comparing it to whole life necessarily here. In the stock market, let's say you get the losses and the dividends, or you could come over here and get no lo- have no losses and no dividends, just the gains. Well, again, all you have to do is just compare them side by side. I don't know why there's so much attention being paid on these little minutia details and then saying things about them that aren't even true. Just go, which one works out better over a 30, 40, 50 year period? Which one works out better? Who cares about how it worked out, which one works out better, okay? Now, if there were policies, for instance, if whole life worked like this, if whole life was you get the S&P 500, basically it's an index universal life insurance policy plus the dividends, and universal life didn't give you the dividends and it was exactly the same apples to apples, then you could make this argument, right? If the stock market gave you the dividends and no losses, you could make this argument. But this is not a sound argument from a man in a position, in a teaching position, owning a company called Truth Concepts, makes an apples to apples argument where it's not apples to apples. Going from the market to index universal life insurance is not apples to apples. Going from whole life to universal life insurance is not apples to apples besides the fact that they're both insurance policies. 
They're different animals. That's why universal life was created because the smartest people in the industry looked at whole life and said, well, that sucks. Doesn't pay enough, has too high of fees. Let's make something better, okay? To attack the better with false arguments and straw men, still, it just doesn't make any sense. And and we always go back to the everything evolves over time. Like you said, the smartest people in the industry got together and they said universal life will pay better than whole life because X, Y, Z. And then universal life evolved to variable because they wanted the market returns. Then it became index and so on. If, if they come out tomorrow and they say, we're going to give you optional dividend, whole life, index, life, whatever, whatever, ver- <laughs> whatever name they title it, and it does prove to be better, then we will be on here talking about that. It be- colossal it becomes- life, right? Somebody calls out colossal life. life and it has <laughs> all 10 of these points, the things he hates. It doesn't have any of those. The insurance company can't change anything. You get the dividends, right? There's no... If you're late, they give you a bonus. You know what I mean? Like, whatever. Like, okay, Colossal Life comes out. The problem is they've proven that they won't switch. They've proven that they're not even open to having the debate or an argument. They're locked into what they sell and they're going to sell it. We're over here going, man, if anything comes out that's better or if somebody would... We're literally here inviting them to come on the show. Say, show me how whole life ends up with more money and more income 30 years from now. And if you show me, we'll go help thousands of families. They go, nah, we don't want to help families. The risk to us is, I'm putting the words in their mouth, but it sounds like they're saying the risk is too high. Oh, what risk? How is there risk when you're a when you're a, a corridor or a door to the truth? Hey, here's what I found. Right. That's it. That's it. It's it's just an evolution of, of learning, just like it is an evolution of products. And, and where we have proven ourselves, where you've proven yourself is as... Everything evolves, so will our understanding of those of those tools, and that's what we're going to bring to people. So, all right, I'm going to jump into the next one, which is the participation ratios. Still, let me hop back over to my screen, and I will share. We are going to talk through participation ratios are often less than 100%. Asterisks, right? So, here we go. Participation ratios are often less than 100%. As mentioned directly above, and this is the dividend portion, as mentioned directly above, the side fund is not invested directly in the index, and many insurance companies only credit a certain percentage of the increase in the market, known as the participation ratio. This is often reported at 80% or less, meaning you only get 80% of the increase in the market. This is getting kind of old. I mean, it's just getting kind of old. Like, this is like five in a row where at the end of this Mm -hmm. monumental point, I go, and, (laughs) and. You know what? That's a good point. Let me, let me, let me read number four and we'll answer both at the same time. Because it's going to be, like you said, it's, it's a little redundant. So, let me, number four. So, recapping for those listening. Participation ratios are often less than 100 and returns are usually capped at various interest rates. Okay, I'm going to read number four, and then we're going to answer them both. So number five talked about 80% or less participation rates. And number four is capping returns in order to keep high returns in the market from crediting too much to the side fund is a strategy many insurance companies use. The maximum return they'll give for for credit may be at a certain percentage rate even though the index may have generated a higher percentage rate. Okay, so I'm going to leave both of those up on the screen, and we are going to talk about both of them together. Go ahead, Charles. I feel like I feel like before writing the article, Todd didn't ever look into Index Universal Life Insurance or call any companies or ask any questions. I spent six hours with, uh, what were they called back in the day? It wasn't Athene. It was, uh, I think it was Indianapolis Life before it was Athene, Aviva, then Athene and Accordia and all those companies. It just, I called and said, how does this work? Like what has, what's actually going on? Like, where's the money go that you guys, the difference between what the index makes and what you credit, where does it go? I don't think he did his research unless everything, every insurance company's ever told me and all the experts are wrong. That's possible, right? Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. But this sentence is probably the worst sentence in the article so far. Capping returns in order to keep high returns in the market from crediting too much. They're trying to keep it from crediting your account. These insurance companies don't want referrals. 
They don't want you making money and sending their friends. Screw that. We don't need customers. What does this even mean? To keep the high returns from crediting your account to the side fund is a strategy many insurance companies use. Okay. That would mean they benefit from the difference, Bobby. So like if they can put a mm-hmm. cap of six and the market makes 20, that means the 14 is going to them. So they try to use this strategy and keep you from getting the money. And I have zero research, zero evidence that that's true. The insurance companies right. are making their money on a regular universal life policy, on a whole life policy, and on a univer- index universal life policy in very similar ways. We give them some money. They invested in bonds mostly in their their portfolio, their general fund, and they keep one or two percent for themselves. The rest goes into something. You know what I mean? It goes right to us, or it buys options, or maybe goes into variable, whatever it is. But they're not keeping the difference between the cap and what the index makes on the options. That's going to an options buyer or something. I don't understand this unless he's done a bunch of research that and found the opposite of what we found to be true. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And then the the point, like I'm not a fan of caps right now. When I <clears throat> started the industry mm-hmm. and the caps were 17. At one point, they were yeah, 17 on Index Universal Life and about 9 or 10 on annuities. I was fine with that to say there's got to be some portion of your portfolio that doesn't go down, kind of like what we used to do with bonds, keep it safe, doesn't go down, and it can earn somewhere between 0 and 10, 0 and 17. It was beautiful. They averaged on the illustrations you know, between 6 and 9. That was great. When caps came down to, you know, if the market goes through the roof, you only get 3. I'm not a fan of caps, so yeah. participation rates, uncapped strategies, but again, to say, hey, you have no losses. You literally can never lose a penny. But guess what? You don't get 100% of the market like when you're in the market and you can have losses. Boo. It just doesn't make any, I don't understand the argument. It just It's a senseless article full of nonsense and statements that at the end, the points he makes at the end, I go, I, still, I don't know what you mean. How is it a negative when you state a fact? Okay. Charlie Jewett is five foot ten. Reasons not to date Charlie Jewett. He's five foot ten. It's not a negative. It's a fact. So you go, <clears throat> reason not to buy index universal life insurance. It only pays you 80% when you can't possibly have losses. Just 80%, Bobby. And I'm going to come back with the same broken record. Okay. Over a 30, 40 year period. Which one wins? 100% with dividends and losses or 80% without dividends and without losses. Hello, Todd. Hello, the entire infinite banking industry. Could any of us possibly think like financial uh, retirement, let's call it retirement planners. I don't know what licenses you have, right? Can we think like retirement planners and insurance agents insuring against future problems and possibly look in the future instead of myopically going, yeah, but this year it only pays 80% and Charlie Jewett's only 5'10". Tell your friends the bad news. He's only 5'10". All right, two things. Number one, our audio guy is going to hate how excited you just got <laughs> with the microphone. You kill us. You kill <laughs> but number two, number two, I'm going to go over just because we're all about education, right? Here's here's the way that crediting strategies work for those who are not familiar. There's a few different options. We are fans of some, not all, and depending on the product, there may be better or worse versions. But think of it this way. First option is a cap. That's what they just talked about, right? A cap says you can earn, you have a floor of zero and the most you can earn is X and X could be 10%. And on, on the years where the market does six, you get all six. And on the years where the market does 15, they cap it at 10. And so that's one strategy. We are not fans of cap strategies, but that doesn't matter for this conversation. Number two, there's participation rates. Participation rates, as in this article, says 80% or less typically. I know that I don't use uh, participation rates that are that low. Uh, We use usually larger participation rates, somewhere sometimes up to 140. We we work with annuities that do 220% of the market, which is absurd and amazing at the same time. But it comes down to whenever the market does, say, 10% and you are at 80 80% participation rate, you get 8%. But when the market does negative 10 or negative 20, you get zero. So a participation rate that has a floor of zero is still winning. 
unless that participation rate is like 10%, in which case you get hardly any returns and we would never let you want you to be in that as well. Another one is called a spread. And a spread is saying that the first couple points of the market, let's say they have a spread of two points. A spread means the first two per two percent go to the company and anything above that is yours so if it goes to 20 percent maybe you the first two percent goes to them and you get 18 percent there are pros and cons to all of it but when you have a floor of zero all of them work and that's why isn't that listed why isn't the spread listed as a negative bobby there's like two there's three options not even in there Two of them are listed as negatives for buying universal life insurance, and they're optional. You don't have to pick a cap strategy. How can that be? And how can that be a reason not to buy the product when it's one of the? Hey, don't buy a house because you could choose cork floors, and cork floors might stain. What? What does that have to do with the house? You know what? Here's a here's a thought. The reason they didn't bring up a spread is because that's how whole life policies work. You only get your dividend after they get their cut. And their dividend <laughs> fluctuates based on their cut. That's just my opinion. Bobby, this is too, just, thinking of, just thinking outside the box. I, I learned this first. This was the first tool that I used. And it was whole life. And I thought it was amazing. And I still think it might have some places. But IUL performs better, has performed better, distributes better, all those things. So when we see people out there just throwing crap like this, we have to talk about it. And so there are different crediting strategies, participation rates, caps, uh, spreads, all those things. Each product has a place. But when you are not getting the dividend returns as somehow a loss or you're capped to 80 percent or you have a a different. What is the other one? Capping returns. So participation rates, capping returns. Any of those with a floor of zero and most of the ups of the market can still be very, very good products if structured correctly. We don't tend to use products that do those things, but even those can be done very well if structured correctly. But that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> yep, exactly. No, it's exactly, it's, it's still the same. Which one works better over time, right? I mean, this this article, yep. the problem with a 10-year-old article is if it was true when it was written. Now, today we do have 220% caps and things like that, 140% cap, 40% bonus, 1% more than the index actually gives you a 1% bonus on top of whatever you're making, blah, 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 right? But it wasn't true when it was written. That's that's what we're addressing really. It's not that it's old. We're not saying that th- yeah. this, this whole series is not, this is outdated and no longer true. It was rubbish when it was written. It doesn't, I don't know if it was immorality or ignorance. It doesn't matter. It wasn't true which though we don't call ourselves truth concepts, we focus on the truth on the show. Two plus two is always four. There's no mystery in it. Nobody needs to debate anything with truth. You just find it. You d- it's more about research and asking questions. Like I could call an insurance company. We should probably do this. We probably should record ourselves calling insurance companies going, is this how you do this? Like when you guys, the market goes up 20. If the cap is eight, do you keep the 12 and purposefully try to not pay their clients? See what they say. Right. Yeah. And, and ultimately, like nobody's saying the insurance companies, all of them, whole, universal, whatever, nobody's saying they don't make money off of your money. By design, they make money off of your money. They're just giving you more benefit in this other vehicle than they are in whole life. That's, that's all we're saying. <laughs> and stop people from going on Shark Tank and hoping that Mark Cuban will be your partner. You're not like, well, he's making money. No, you want him to make money. You want him to get excited. Exactly. All right, guys, that's the end of this episode. We're going to wrap up this series on the next episode. But until then, I'm Bobby Alford. This is Charlie Jewett. Mahalo. You people are the best. Thanks so much for listening to Renovating Retirement. We hope you enjoyed the episode. If you have time please subscribe to the podcast and consider rating and reviewing the show that will help others find us. And for show notes, resources mentioned and to connect head on over to renovating retirement.com. Thanks again for listening and we'll catch you next time on renovating retirement. <laughs>